Hi, and welcome to South by Southwest. I'm thrilled to introduce the featured session, Live from Space, NASA Astronauts in Your Work in Orbit. Please welcome to the stage, Leah Cheshire, Jennifer Buckley, and Kristen Fobb. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for getting up this morning and coming to join us at South by Southwest. We're really excited to be here. We'll get in with some introductions because coming up in just a few minutes, we are gonna be talking to two of our panelists. They couldn't be here with us in the room today because they are living in space. Um, so just to start off, my name is Leah Cheshire. I am a public affairs officer at Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas. Um, I work with the humans in space team. That means I work everything International Space Station, commercial low earth orbit, commercial crew program, and I do live TV commentary for NASA missions, which is my favorite part. And Jennifer, I'll go over to you to introduce yourself. Good morning, I'm Jennifer Buckley. I am the ISS program chief scientist. Um, I provide the science strategy for the ISS program. Um, I provide science recommendations to the ISS program, program manager um, at headquarters on ways that we should be utilizing uh, the International Space Station, manage the priorities for ISS, and ensure that we are fully utilizing all of our capability. Thanks so much. Kristen, over to you. All right, yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Kristen Fobb. I'm the Deputy Chief Scientist at the Human Research Program. Uh, so it's for us, it's really all about the human. How do we keep our humans safe and healthy in space? So it's all about reducing risk that uh, the crew may experience during spaceflight. So that could be physiological, like bone and muscle, and how does exercise play a role in that? It could be psychological, so behavioral health, stress, sleep, medical capabilities. And so it's all about understanding those risks and how do we counter those risks to make sure that we um, set our crew up for optimal crew health and performance during space exploration. All right, thank you. Well, let's get into it. So before we start, uh, we want to ask your questions to the astronauts today. So if you go into the South by Southwest app and you check out our panel, there is a button that says engage. You can go in there, submit questions for Slido, um, and we'll get a chance to ask some of those. So before we get started, what is a downlink? That's what we're about to do with these astronauts. They are living and working 250 miles above our heads, traveling 17,500 miles per hour. That's orbital velocity. And this is how we communicate with our crew members. So they do these downlinks either with schools or events like this, um, but we also remain in contact with the astronauts pretty much at all times uh, with some exceptions for satellite handovers so that our researchers on the ground can communicate with them when they are running some experiments. Do either of you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure, I can talk a little bit um, about that. So uh, we'll talk um, probably in a few minutes about the types of science that the crew's doing right now. Um, at any given time during their mission, they'll be doing uh, a variety of science, about 250 to 300 experiments. Um, and so as you can imagine, um, those are pretty labor intensive. The crew often has their hands in a glove box. Um, you'll see some, uh, some of their workspaces here in a few moments. Um, and so we use our comm on space station basically to enable the scientists real time. So you can walk the crew members through um, your experiment as you're doing it on space station. They can give you feedback on how things look. You can adjust it and make tweaks. And that's been uh, just a tremendous evolution over the, the life of the program um, to be able to do something like that. I'll chat really quickly about a downlink some more too. So it's sort of a, um, a song and dance, you know, it's a, it's a call and response. So we have teams in Mission Control Houston. They work 24-7, 365, monitoring the health of the space station and helping it fly, um, as well as obviously the health and happiness of our astronauts. And so we'll be getting calls from the CAPCOM. That's the capsule communicator. Um, that is the one person in the room who speaks with the astronauts to make sure that they are getting all of their information from one place, keep it streamlined and clear and concise. Uh, so they will call out to us and make sure that we're ready for the event. We will let them know that we are more than ready Ready for the event and we'll get things started. So before that happens in just a few minutes, a few more fast facts about the International Space Station. The space station is about the size of a football field, an American football field from end zone to end zone, um, including the solar arrays. And it's about the size of a six bedroom house. So at all times, we typically have about seven people living and working in orbit. That's the number that is there right now because just yesterday, 
four people who were living on the space station came home. Uh, last week, we launched four new crew members. They completed a handover. And this morning at 4.47 a.m. Central Time, uh, the four returning crew members boosted Earth's population once again and splashed down just off the coast of Pensacola, um, healthy and happy after 199 days in space. So they spend about six months in orbit. We're going to be talking with Jeanette Epps, who just arrived a week ago today, as well as Laurel O'Hara, who launched in September 2023. And she's getting ready to come home here pretty soon. So two different perspectives, both first-time flyers. And uh, we're pretty excited. I mean, I hope you guys are excited. Any day you get to talk to space, I can't complain. It's a good day. <laughs> All right, so we should be getting that call from them in just seriously seconds now. Um, but anything else anybody wanted to share about the International Space Station, about our work in orbit? Actually, I, I'm really excited. You were just mentioning the, the swap off, so we were talking about Crew 8. Um, so we're really excited because we have some new countermeasures, and so we're thinking about space motion sickness. We're actually going to be testing how we can reduce space motion sickness, which is a big deal for some of our crews. So we're really excited to test some of these out. Uh, it's really because of the International Space Station that we can understand what's happening, these changes that really help us to come up with how do we. How do we get them so they're not feeling so woozy? And I'm seeing our astronauts, so I think we're about to get started. I'm going to stand by for those calls for Mission Control Houston. <laughs> Unfortunately, they can't see us, so. <laughs> We can hear you, though. We have you loud and clear. <laughs> Hi, Laurel. Hi, Jeanette. Thank you so much for joining us today, and welcome to South by Southwest. All right. Well, to, to get us started, Laurel, you've been up there for six months now. Thank and Jeanette, you just arrived last week. How's it been for both of you getting started here? Well, it's funny, we're on opposite ends of our mission. And um, for me, it's just been an amazing six months up here. Um, it's been especially fun um, having Crew 8 get here and get to relive my first couple weeks through their eyes on Space Station. Just, uh, you know, getting to do all the things we've been training to do for so many years, um, see Space Station in real life, see Earth from the cupola. Um, it's just a bunch of amazing days and inspiring moments up here. And then I'll let Jeanette chime in as well. Well, I have to agree. It, it has been amazing to finally see this after so many years. And it has been a, a very big learning curve, learning how to move in space. Laurel so calm up, you know, every now and then you'll see me do that because I'm still getting used to how to operate in a zero G environment, but it is a wonderful thing um, to see the Earth from this vantage point, to see the space station, to do the work that we've trained our whole lives to do. Awesome. Well, just to dive in, we have some questions here from the audience in the room. Uh, we'll start with this one. How has your perspective on our planet changed since you've been in space? That's one of my favorite questions because seeing Earth from the International Space Station is probably my favorite, one of my favorite parts of being up here. Um, to get to see our planet as one whole planet, um, you can see entire continents from one spot uh, from Space Station as we're flying over them. And to get to see Earth from that perspective makes you realize how small our planet is and also, you know, not seeing borders and seeing it and against the blackness of space and the backdrop of stars. Um, it's just amazing and it makes, you what it makes you realize what a special and unique place we have on planet Earth and how much more we have in common with each other than we have differences. Thanks, Laurel. You're getting a round of applause in the room. I think we all echo that. All right, next question. 
you know, we have a lot of people here who are uh, tech developers, entrepreneurs, and they want to know, considering all the teamwork, discipline, focus, and the other abilities required to be an astronaut, what can entrepreneurs learn from your experiences? Well, I like to think that we're just a reminder that we do have to work together, build teams to be productive and perform at a really high level. And so for tech um, giants and entrepreneurs out there, you know, the projects that you work on, how to be inclusive, how to um, co um, cultivate an environment where teams can work effectively together, you know, those are some of the things that we also work on here. Okay, I'm gonna take the next question. Um, can you share uh, some examples of the science experiments you've conducted on the International Space Station um, that have led to groundbreaking discoveries or uh, maybe what you guys have been working on just this increment that we will um, see some of the results coming back soon? Yeah, it's been super fun up here work, getting to work on a wide array of science, um, everything from life sciences to material sciences, uh, combustion experiments. Uh, we get to do a little bit of everything every day. Some of the stuff that we've had going on this week um, is an experiment called Flawless Space Fibers, where we are producing a ha higher quality optical fiber than we can on Earth, um, looking at the materials and processes for that production. And then Jeanette's actually been working yesterday and today on an experiment called SIR, uh, which is a combustion experiment. And they are, they study all sorts of different things. Right now they're looking at um, different fire extinguishing techniques for the Orion capsule. Um, so different ways to put out flames in some of our exploration vehicles. Uh, so those are just two examples of the kind of work that we get to do up here. Do actually, I, I'm loving this question. Uh, so this question is, my 13-year-old daughter asks, if you could upgrade your living and workspaces, what would you add? She would love to be a lunar architect in the future. So we're, we're laughing here because, uh, you know, one of my suggestions was to add a WHC to every room. A WHC is a waste hygiene compartment. It's our toilet. <laughs> but, you know, we always ask for that in, in our houses, too. Um, it's interesting because, you know, one person was saying that they would love to put their head down and trying to figure out a way where you could have a place where you can actually feel like you're putting your head down would be great. But it's actually, you know, you kind of float here and you don't really lay down at all. So it's kind of hard to say what we, I would add because I think our, our compartments are, they're, they're small, but they're pretty comfortable. <laughs> Thank you for the demonstration as well. Uh, for the people in the room, the astronauts essentially have a crew quarters that's about the size of a coat closet because you don't need a bed in space necessarily. So they, they kind of strap up to the wall and get cozy and uh, that is how they sleep. So I think laying your head down would feel pretty good. <laughs> yeah, once, once you get used to sleeping up here, just floating in space is also really nice. And then I'll just add, we always want more windows. Yeah. Good views. I don't blame you. I hope to try that floating sometime. Speaking of that, for this crew, we are hiring new astronauts right now. So a question for the astronauts living and working on the International Space Station. What advice would you give to anyone aspiring to be an astronaut or prepare for a career in space-related research? Uh, my, the first thing I would say is to follow your passions and interests. Um, in doing so, you and then also stay, re, just remain, op, keep an open mind as you move forward and learn new things. Um, keep an eye out for opportunities because, at least for me, what I found, you know, I started off with a certain path in my head, but as I learned more and started studying different topics, um, you never know where your interests will lead you um, down really interesting career paths. The Earth is a fascinating place to explore. 
I have to echo exactly what Laurel said. You know, I would also add to that, um, you know, following your passion, you can never go wrong. No matter what you do in life, as long as you're passionate about it, you'll end up somewhere great. You never know where you'll end up. You may even end up on the space station. But, you know, the other thing also is being able to live with other people who aren't like you, who don't look like you, and to be in a team environment like this has been amazing. Since I've come on board last week, Laurel has been awesome in helping me get adapted to this environment. So it's been, um, it's been very interesting. Um, being flexible, adaptable, and a good crewmate is probably one of the most important things that you need to get here. But also, you have to have a technical background. But I think having that mentality where you're going to be a good crewmate and you're going to help your crewmate adapt whatever they need and, and try to like reciprocate that, um, I think is very important in this kind of environment. All right, next question. Another one from the audience here. Is there a major challenge that you have had so far while in space? So since I'm new, um, the challenges I've had in just conducting one, um, well, the second major experiment that I did um, this time was managing stuff. Because if you put something down and it's not tethered, it's going to float away. And finding it is way harder than you think. Um, <laughs> it floats away. It has its own mind. So managing everything that comes out of a bag even. You open a bag and everything wants to escape. So management of stuff has been probably the most surprising to me, especially with a big experiment that, um, like the SIR one that we conducted this week. And yeah, we, we were talking earlier about this. Um, one of the fascinating things about being up here is how fast, is how quickly our brains adapt to the microgravity environment. So, you know, in the first couple weeks, microgravity is a challenge that you have to overcome. It's something that you're, you know, it, that's working against you. But the longer you stay up here, it becomes something that helps you out. So in the first couple weeks I was here, um, like Jeanette's describing, you're, you're kind of working in spite of it and now it's a tool that i use um, you know floating something next to me or taking advantage of the fact that we can spring and be on any surface at any moment um, those are all things that are super helpful okay and i'm gonna ask this next one um, so what is the tastiest food you've had in space and then if i can expand to that can you maybe talk about the importance of food in space Yeah, I think food is um, something that's always important to people. Um, it's definitely something that brings us together. It reflects our different cultures. Um, and we all look forward to a good meal at the end of a long, hard work day. Uh, some of my favorite foods, actually, interestingly, my favorite foods have changed a lot but since I was up here. Um, things that I really liked when I first got on orbit, now I don't like them as much, and I like things that the first time I tried them when I got up here, I was like, no way, I, I don't like that. So um, it's been interesting just to see you know, over the course of the six months and our relatively limited, but I think really good menu um, has changed. Well, I have to agree, like, um, for example, trying the Mexican scrambled eggs that we have here were not good for me, but Laurel <laughs> loves them. <laughs> yeah. So the, I guess the tastiest food that I've had was, <laughs> was the, you know, I, I guess it was the curried vegetables that I really like, and along with the chicken fajitas. Chicken fajitas are pretty good here. Wow. Yeah, we, do have, we do have taco nights up here, and those are always a favorite for everybody. <laughs> taco night in space. I'm there for it. <laughs> Sure. So the next question, um, I think uh, Kristen will appreciate from the Human Research Program. Someone is asking, what does your exercise routine look like in space? Great question. Uh, we're scheduled for two and a half hours of exercise a day. Um, and that usually includes an hour and a half of weightlifting on our weightlifting device, which is called A-RED. Um, also, our which is also in front of Cupola, so a space gym with amazing views. 
And then we also have a treadmill so we can run and a stationary bicycle so we get to do cycling. And we'll usually alternate between running and cycling each day. Those are some of our favorite two hours because in microgravity, it doesn't take a lot of um, energy to move your body around. Just with fingertip force, you can fly across the room. Uh, so exercise is really the only way we get to load our body up and actually feel tired. And so uh, that's something I definitely miss up here. And so I really enjoy the exercise hours. Yeah, and it's one of the, the countermeasures that we use for our bones and our muscles as well. Like um, moving around here is really easy, like Laurel said. But if we um, don't exercise and when we get back to Earth, you know, we, we may have some muscle loss and maybe some bone density loss. So exercise is a must. Thank you both. I think we all have some experience with telework. So I like this next question. Um, as the world's most remote workers, do you have any tips for, <laughs> for how to work uh, well with your team members and your teammates that are actually on Earth? Definitely. Space Station is an excellent platform for that, like you mentioned. Um, and I think kind of like Jeanette was saying earlier, just um, keeping an eye out for each other and helping, out, helping each other out when you can. Uh, like for example, up here when we get close to the end of a day, um, if someone's finished with their tasks a little early, they go and check with everybody and see if anyone needs help with theirs. Um, even something as simple as you know, putting in dinner for one of their crewmates who's still working, um, that's really helpful. And then along the same lines, being able to take care of yourself. So make sure you're getting enough rest and personal time so that you can be focused and present for your team uh, when, when they need you to be. Yeah, and, and you know, even to the point of like, we have one um, toilet, one WHC, you know, being the courteous one, making sure you're not the one to like, you know, leave the toilet up like on earth or something bad. So, uh, you know, just being a really good crewmate and just considering how you would feel if someone helped you and, and try to do that for your, your fellow crewmate. Uh, I'll tell you that um, Laurel has been extremely helpful in getting me through this week and a lot of little things that, you know, sometimes you don't think matter, but it goes a long way. So you guys have talked a lot about um, teamwork and working together. Um, how do you celebrate things in space? So how do you um, celebrate holidays or maybe um, have that time together as a crew? Great question. Uh, I got to celebrate Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's on board. And uh, one of the things we got from the ground was special food, Bob, so some special holiday food. Uh, that was great. And then we also decorated the module, like for, um, for Thanksgiving and Christmas, we hung up decorations. Uh, Jasmine, who just landed on back on planet Earth today, made us all stockings with our name on it so we could put gifts in there. That was super fun. And then we also just do things like bake cakes if it's somebody's birthday. Um, we have some cake decorating supplies up here. So that's always fun. Right. Um, so you don't have a typical day and night on station. And so can you talk to us about your perception of time, uh, your sleep cycles? How does all of that work in on ISS? Time to me has been really funny on space station. Um, like you said, we don't have a sunset and a sunrise every day, we have 16. So in many senses, we get multiple days in one um, and you just don't have the same light cues like you do on Earth. So it can be a real time warp up here. Um, I'll start working on something and think a couple minutes has passed and it'll be an hour or two. Uh, so time really flies. And then if I look at my entire mission, um, I will have spent 200 days in space by the time I go home. and. Even just this year, it's been you know 72 days already, and they've just gone by in the blink of an eye. Um, even though sometimes our days can you know stretch on, we have 12-hour work days. Uh, the time overall is just flying. 
Don't worry, they are also uh, going by pretty fast here on Earth, too. I didn't realize we were 72 days into the year. Um, another question, I love this one. My 10-year-old daughter has always dreamed of becoming an astronaut and the first woman on Mars. What fields of science do you think someone should study that will be particularly relevant in the future? Well, it's interesting. I think Laurel alluded to following your passions earlier, and um, I have to agree. As long as you're in a technical field, I think they, you know, the requirements now say you have to be in a technical field. I'm aerospace and Laurel's also aerospace. We're both <laughs> marine biology. Well, but she's done so many different things outside of aerospace as well. And so it's kind of interesting. You can be aerospace. Um, biology, we have geologists, we have fighter pilots who are like, who are also electrical engineers. We have medical doctors. So there's many different paths you can take. I would say pick your passion and follow it. And I'll just add, um, for exploration in general and NASA's mission, um, it really takes a wide variety of people to support that. So um, beyond just being an astronaut, you have uh, photographers, you have, um, we have people in, yeah. Flight directors, flight, <laughs> yeah, flight, flight directors, flight controllers, we have publicists, we have graphic artists, uh, we have, of course, a broad human resources support. So pretty much any job that people are doing in a small town, uh, people are doing at NASA. And so if you want to be in a, involved in exploration, um, there's a lot of different ways to do that. Thank you both so much. I know that we are running out of time with you two today. We'll let you get back to your hard work aboard the space station. So thank you again, Jeanette. We can't wait to see everything you do over the next six months. And Laurel, we can't wait to welcome you home to Earth in just a few weeks. Thank you so much for the questions. We're super excited to be there today. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. That never gets old. No, I was going to say the same thing. That's still cool. <laughs> Wow, okay, well thank you all so much again for being here. We're gonna bring it back down to Earth a little bit uh, and talk about some of the research that's going on aboard the International Space Station. So, to get started, what is International Space Station research broad? Let's lay it out. Yeah, that's a great question. Laurel touched on that a little bit. Um, we have a huge diversity in the type of research that we do on space station. Um, and that has grown a lot over the years from when we started early days to what we are doing now. Um, so we just celebrated our 25th anniversary for the space station program of, of having a space station um, orbiting the Earth. Um, and so now we are doing research in biological sciences. So this would include things like cell biology. We do a fair amount of tissue engineering. Um, we do a lot of plant research, which is important um, both to support our crew members as well as for exploration. Um, we have a robust physical sciences program. So we do combustion research. Um, we do fluid physics. We also have um, a really unique vantage point, right? So you talked a little bit about um, we're orbiting the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour, um, but we have instruments on space station both looking out into space, so we do space science, um, so we do things like astrophysics, heliophysics, and then also looking down. Um, so we do a lot of Earth science um, that we can talk about a little bit later, um, but we really are using space station to inform us about, um, about our, our Earth and our world here. Um, and then we do a lot of tech demos. Um, a lot of those are for exploration, uh, but we do some for medical support of the crew as well. Um, and then finally, we do um, STEM engagement. So it's really important to us at NASA to make sure that we are um, inspiring the next generation um, of scientists and explorers and, and folks to come work with us. Maybe if I expand on that a little bit, um, there were some great examples uh, that we had from our astronauts about the importance of exercise. And so, um, you know, they have all of these technologies up on station now. So they have the treadmill, they have a way that they can cycle, they have a weightlifting mach machine essentially. So like they can get strong, they can keep their strength, their muscle mass, keep their bone mineral density up. 
Um, and it's, it's really with the partnership that we have with ISS. It's a very unique place for us to learn how to live and thrive in space. And so these are just some examples. The plant example is so huge because it's about nutrition. It's about behavioral health. Like how does it reduce stress? And so just really emphasizing on what you're talking about, Jen. And, but I mean, that's 25 years of learning and understanding how to do all of the things that you're just mentioning. Yeah, I think that's a, a good point. I, a couple of things I want to pull from that. One is the 25 years. So for 23 of those years, we have had somebody living in space at all times. So if you are under 23, the entire population of Earth has never been totally on Earth. You've always had somebody living in space during your lifetime. I think that's cool. Another thing you talked about is how important the space station is on helping us learn to live and work in space. Obviously, the space station is where we're at right now. Like we mentioned, this is 250 miles above our heads. We can typically get there and get home within a few hours, definitely within a day um, if we needed to. But when we think about going to the moon and Mars, the moon is 1,000 times farther away from from Earth than the space station is. So it becomes a little bit more of a journey. We have to know a little bit more about living and working in space because we're going to the moon and eventually to Mars to stay. We want to have a more permanent presence there. So how is space station research preparing us for those future missions to the moon and Mars? Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll let Kristen open this one first for human research, right? That's something that, that we all think about is how do we prepare our astronauts to be able to make those journeys? Yeah, I mean, so Artemis is definitely on our mind and then how do we use the moon to get us to Mars, right? And so we think about unique hazards that the crew can experience for space exploration. And so one can be radiation. So that could be galactic cosmic radiation, that could be solar radiation. Uh, it could be distance from Earth. You were just talking about the distance from Earth to the moon and then Mars is so much further. Uh, the isolation and confinement. And so uh, the International Space Station, you did get some, some uh, idea of the size of the station, but maybe our exploration vehicles are gonna be smaller. So what's that isolation and confinement going to do? And then there's also things like just the environment. What's the lighting and the sounds? Or if we're doing a surface mission, lunar dust, what does that do to our health or Martian dust? But what I love about the, the ISS is that it is the best place to study extended time and microgravity. There is no place like that on Earth. In fact, it's not, it's in space. Uh, so we have this great lab that we can understand a very unique hazard for space exploration, and that is an, on an uh, International Space Station. Yes, yeah, so we have a couple investigations that are specifically targeting exploration. How do we test technologies for our um, Moon and Mars programs? Um, so you know, the advantage of having a space station that has been up there for such a long time is that we have runtime. Um, so these journeys that are going to take us beyond the lunar surface and onto Mars, you need to make sure that you have a really robust uh, life support system. You need to make sure that your water systems work well. Um, so one of the ones um, that I worked on when I first came to NASA was our regenerative, uh, we call it ECLIS, Environmental Control and Life Support System. Um, so this is really um, what recycles our water on board and provides the crew with drinking water. Um, that water then turns into, uh, we, we split the water, right, and the, that oxygen gets um, pumped back into the cabin. Um, so that's the air that the crew members uh, breathe. And then we have to scrub CO2 out of the environment. Um, and, you know, on the International Space Station, we had the luxury of, in the beginning, as we're trying to bring these systems online, uh, flying bags of water if something happened, um, if our system went down or something broke. But, you know, we don't have that as we go these further distances. And so that has really served us as a wonderful platform to be able to test out these uh, systems and do, do some of our tech demos. Um, we also talk about when we go to the moon, um, or we go back to the moon, I should say, um, we're going to have a more sustainable presence. And what does that mean? That means um, we are going to have a presence on the lunar surface. Um, and we're going to need infrastructure to support that. Um, so a lot of our um, experiments, like we talked about, you know, things like greenhouses, plant growth, um, those are things that we'll want to do on the lunar surface, as well as um, even building structures and infrastructure. Um, so we've done some experiments on the International Space Station. We have a centrifuge up there where we've looked at how does concrete 
um, like substances form in space? Can we use lunar regolith, which is like a lunar lunar dirt, right? How do you how do you use that, and can you use that to make building materials? Um, and so uh, we've done things like, what does it look like on microgravity? We can spin it in our centrifuge and say, what does this look like in lunar gravity? And what does this look like in Martian gravity? Um, so this is really informing a lot of the technologies that we'll need for our exploration programs. And just wanted to uh, give everyone a heads up before we move on to our next question that you can also ask questions of our panelists. So don't forget to go into the app, let us know what you're wondering about, and we're gonna get to those in just a few minutes. But to uh, bring it back home and make it a little more relatable, I think, how does what we're doing on the International Space Station through this research benefit life on Earth for, for all of us? Uh, yeah, I could start with that. So we actually study a lot of things that probably, you know, are very relatable. So like imagine if, uh, if you remember COVID, uh, we were all isolated. We were all stuck in our homes. We all had to adapt to a remote environment. We may have been stuck with people that we didn't necessarily want to be stuck with for a year. Um, so how do we deal with that? How do we study that? How do we make sure that we can thrive in those types of environments? And that's very similar to the things that we study is how do we work on team dynamics? How do we work on uh, behavioral health? What does the impact of important nutrition and exercise do for behavioral health? Uh, we study things like cancer. So we, again, I mentioned earlier, something like radiation. So we wanna understand long-term effects. So we can study things like neurocognitive uh, complications like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's and cancer. Um, Jen mentioned earlier medical technologies, and so we think about our tech demos, and so we want to be able to do a lot of our blood analysis or um, trying to take samples and do analysis right there on the spot. Uh, so if we have the ability to do that in space, then we can perhaps have the ability to do this anywhere on Earth, particularly in populations where maybe it's harder to get medical health care to them. Yeah, I think some of those biomedical examples kind of come to mind first um, when we talk about things like that. Um, science and, and, and um, biology works very different in microgravity, right? And we can use that to our advantage. Um, so 3D structures form more readily. Um, so you can do things like protein crystal growth. Um, so those are proteins that are really hard for scientists to um, recreate the structures here on Earth because you're fighting against gravity. That's been hugely successful in the pharmaceutical industry for the International Space Station. So we have been able to um, support investigations for advances of things like um, a drug that's in clinical trials now for Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Um, we also had some early work on um, being able to take the, um, the chemotherapy drug or, or um, you know, cancer drug, Keytruda, um, and help um, make that protein um, in a way that, that patients could receive it as an injection to make it easier for people to take. Um, we do a lot of um, organoid type research, um, and uh, we even have a 3D bioprinter on board. Um, so this helps us have insight into creating models that we can potentially use on the ground, but also, you know, use in space. So um, Jeanette's going to be working on an experiment where we're looking at um, brain organoids in space and testing different therapeutics for neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and obviously those, those things are much easier to do when you're not fighting against gravity and you have these 3D structures more like what you would have in, in the human body. Um, we uh, also, I talked a little bit about some of our external instruments that are looking down on the earth. Um, I, I'm very passionate um, about, about kind of the suite of instruments because I think it's a really great perspective that we have. Um, we have instruments that, that work together. So we have EcoStress, which looks at um, plant temperatures and can tell us how global warming is impacting um, plants and tropical forest canopies here on earth. Um, we have JEDI, which then uh, also looks at that growth and, and how, um, how plants are performing, how the tree canopy is forming. Um, and then we have um, OCO3, which is our uh, orbiting carbon observatory. So that looks at what's happening in the, the carbon cycle um, here on Earth too. And so I think the really unique thing about the International Space Station and, and low Earth uh, platforms with this capability in general is this is the only place that all of these instruments can work together. You can put each individual one on a satellite 
Um, but the International Space Station passes over 95% of the Earth's inhabited surfaces. So now you stack these all on the same platform, on the same orbit where they have power, they have data, they have thermal cooling, um, and you can really get a powerful picture of what's happening globally, and that can inform a lot of our policy decisions and, and help us decide um, what we want to do going forward. For me, I'm, I'm passionate about NASA spinoffs, which is an entirely separate thing. So the work has been done, and then people on Earth can take it and say, how can we use this to advance uh, something else? And that could be a product, um, and I think those are fascinating. So you can really search anything on the spinoff website. I've tested it, and it seems that there has been uh, something that they've used NASA research for to improve products or um, you know, processes here on Earth. Yeah, can we talk about the colloid work Please, that's in talk that? about it. Yeah, so that one's really cool. Um, we had uh, an experiment called ACE, um, which was looking at colloid. So um, we don't have sedimentation in microgravity, right? So things that are in suspension don't sink to the bottom. Um, so they were looking at um, kind of uh, colloids, these, these particles that are suspended in fluids in microgravity to figure out how you can um, improve things for medication or even like household products, right? How do you improve the, the shelf stability um, of these types of solutions? And, and Procter & Gamble actually has three patents now off of work that they've done on the space station um, looking at these types of things. So that's a great example, Leah. I love it. All right, we're going to get into some questions from our friends in the audience. Um, let's see. In a world that is becoming increasingly becoming less globalized, less globalized, sorry, how do you guys imagine the future of International Space Station and international space travel? So I, I can talk to the international aspect of it. You know, um, that's one thing that I think we have learned to do really well in our 25 years of, of the International Space Station, um, as it is truly a partnership um, with our international partners. Um, I talk a lot about the science on space station, but just the engineering feat of building a space station um, with, uh, you know, multiple countries assembling modules that have never been fit checked on the ground, putting them together for the first time in space, your communication has to be very good. Um, and so, you know, I, I, um, I think as far as where we're going with this, um, you know, none of us can do this alone. Um, space is hard. You will hear people say that over and over again. It is hard. Um, it's very expensive, and we can go much farther if we go together and combine our resources. Maybe I could just add to that. I mean, what, what you see, the science that you're seeing images on, uh, the, what the crew have been talking about, the experiments that they're doing, they're doing um, there is probably, you know, a couple hundred people that are behind some of those studies. and um, really just to emphasize that you can't do it alone uh, for our program just as, as well as yours or even across the agency. Those international partnerships, partnerships in general, um, are crucial for us because people will have unique perspectives uh, based on your culture, based on where you come from. And so having that new perspective, that diverse perspective, really helps us to make sure that we're getting the best type of equipment, the best type of science, the best type of questions that set us up for uh, some of these successful missions. And so just really emphasizing on everything what Jen said there. And I think I can touch on, too, the future of the International Space Station and space travel. You know, we can't have the space station forever, unfortunately. Um, and so we are already working on what that looks like to maintain our human presence in low Earth orbit. So we're working with private companies that are building their own private space stations. And eventually, NASA wants to be one of many customers to these. Um, and we are already seeing, you know, we are launching astronauts on private spacecraft owned by, I should say, owned by private companies. Um, and we are one of many customers for those. So that allows us to take what we've been putting our efforts and our resources to on the International Space Station and start looking out further into space and start planning for the Artemis generation and our trips to the moon. Um, so that's a little bit about the future of the space station and space travel in general. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Leah. You know, the International Space Station um, is approved and funded to operate until 2030. Um, we know structurally it can continue on um, perhaps beyond that. Um, but, you know, NASA's mission really is to start partnering with some of these commercial companies that are looking at building uh, commercial LEO destinations. So you'll hear us talk about CLDs. Um, that's the next low Earth orbit generation, or, or um, generation of space stations. Um, and that will really allow us to look at stepping out into the solar system and focusing on exploration. 
I like this question. How are experiments and knowledge shared between teams from different countries? Is there a global idea of who wants to work on what? And are there shared teams? And are there project leaders? Well, I'll, I'll take a, a start at that. And then I'm sure that Jen can expand to the, the science and overall. But um, so we do have databases that uh, are available to our researchers. And so if we do experiments or if we have crew samples, um, we do experiments on those crew samples, uh, we do try to have those databases available so that a researcher could come in and request certain types of data to give an example or what their study is and then request the type of data that they need to, to do their studies. Uh, so that is for domestic as a, an example of how to share data. Uh, now, as we're talking about the international partnerships, this is actually things that we are working on right now. We are, we are understanding that we are now in this data age where we can do big data, we can do these complex algorithms, machine learning, AI, uh, how do we work together? What's the guidance? What's the policies of what we need to do like to protect our astronauts, uh, our, our, the, the data from the crew, but also to make sure that we have the right type of availability in, the, in this world. So we're working on right now our, our how we do our data sharing across both commercial and international partnerships. How do we navigate through that? Uh, it's complex, but that's, that's something that we think is very important and we're actively working on. Go ahead. I was just going to move on to the next question, but if you want to add something. No, I was just going to talk about the international partner aspect. I think they talked about, you know, um, different contributions or strengths, right? And, and Kristen touched on a little bit earlier. Um, each country has their, their strength, right? Um, so, you know, one example that always comes to mind is, you know, on the space shuttle, right? We have the, um, the robotic arm was built by Canada, right? So when you go to build an international space station, Canada is one of your partners. Guess who built our arm, right? Um, so everyone has things that they um, bring to the table that they are very strong in, both nation nationally, right, um, uh, that they contribute to, uh, to our different programs. All right, here's another one. Is there always a doctor in the crew or someone with medical training? So we have, um, it depends on the, the crew, right? Uh, but we also have what we call flight doctors um, so that each crew member will have assigned a, a flight doc, is what we call them, and they work with the crew on all medical conditions or needs or questions that they may have. Uh, but I'm not sure, Jen, if you can speak to, I mean, I think it's just depending on the crew that's assigned on if they have a medical background or not, but we always want to make sure that there is access to any medical needs or questions or concerns uh, with, our flight, with our flight doc. Yeah, we do have a number of astronauts in the office who um, are medical doctors or, or have medical backgrounds, um, and so obviously it's great if they're on the crew, um, but also, uh, you know, we think about the, um, we always think about the what if scenarios, right? So what if something happens and that crew member is sick and needs help? And so all crew members get um, kind of a, a baseline level of training on medical response and medical support. And then if you don't have um, a physician on the crew, um, then you have someone who gets a little bit more training um, to be able to um, you know, intervene and help people on orbit as they work with teams on the ground. Right now on Crew 8, we happen to have um, Mike Barrett on board. Um, so he is an MD and he um, kind of literally wrote the textbook on aerospace medicine. Um, so they're in really good hands. And I may maybe expand on that a little bit uh, and just and take that to the next level of the future is this is where we can actually start to look at VR, virtual reality or augmented reality so that we can in these unknown unknowns when we're doing space exploration, so when we're moving from the moon and beyond, how can we take advantage of virtual reality and augmented reality to train or to help guide on medical conditions? So having some more um, self-reliance on some of these conditions that may arise during space exploration so that we kind of see that as the future uh, that we want to pursue. And I think, too, we're, we're looking at the original telehealth as well. You know, they have private medical conferences weekly or any time that they need one. They're able to speak with someone on the ground, a flight surgeon, a flight doctor, um, who, and they can share how they're feeling emotionally, how they're feeling physically, and that's someone on the ground who has that expertise and that training to help them feel better. So if you've ever used telehealth, I, uh, you know, you're not far off from what an astronaut on the space station might experience. Uh, let's see. Do you have, do any of you have plans to visit the space station? I wish. 
any, any time they want to offer, I'm, I, I'll go. I think I have to save up some money to do one of the private astronaut oh, yeah. missions. Yeah. It's a little... If anyone wants to fund me, I will go. Okay, let's see. The ISS is a scientific lab. How do, research, how do researchers ensure the scientific experiments conducted in microgravity can be translated and have a positive impact back on Earth? I mean, yeah, I could take a, a, an example take a stab at that so yes so when we do the flight studies on on station like these are we find this to be very important they actually help us to plan for those future missions but as we were talking about earlier and like how does our research come back to how does it help on earth so we again we have a team of scientists that plan for these we have a team of people that implement the research on ISS we work with our colleagues across the agency we work with our ISS program peers to make sure that we are integrated and that we can perform our science and if we have troubleshooting if we need to uh, to if there's a glitch or a problem in the study that we have a team to support to ensure that we get the science that we need but again, just to emphasize, a lot, of the, a lot of the studies that we do, we think have on Earth applications like behavioral health, like how do you deal with team dynamics. And so the studies that we do, we'll publish on and say, here's the impact, here's what we're learning on, on station, here's where we're learning on these isolation analogs across the planet and how this can hopefully be applied and translated into uh, everybody's um, daily lives. Yeah, and the research that we do on space station isn't just for space. Um, so the International Space Station is a um, national lab. So you'll hear us talk about the ISS National Lab. What this means is that Congress designated the International Space Station as a lab. Um, so starting in 2005, um, it is a national lab. So it means 50% of resources on the International Space Station are open uh, to the American public for basically non-NASA use. Um, so there is um, uh, CASIS, the Center for Advancement of Science in Space, or you can find them on ISS National Lab. Um, so if you have ideas of research that can improve life here on Earth, um, but needs microgravity to do your research, um, it is open to the American public um, to come do so. All right, next question. How does the partnership with private entities like SpaceX, how has, the pri how has the partnership with private entities like SpaceX helped space missions? It, it's a game changer. It, it's opened up opportunities. Uh, you know, first of all, just being able to launch on, on U.S. soil again and being able to have a higher cadence of crew that can go to the International Space Station and do the type of research that we need to understand what what are the risks, what are the hazards for space exploration? This is, it's disruptive, it's a game changer. Um, and, and not only just SpaceX, we actually have a whole group of people um, that are focused on those commercial partnerships within our program on what's, what's the future look like for CLDs, as Jim was saying. And so some of these partners that are going to have these low Earth orbit uh, stations that we will continue to do our studies on, uh, it's, it's gonna be critical for us. Also, what are, what are our private astronaut missions looking like? What, what experiences are these, these private astronauts experiencing? They don't go through the type of astronaut training that our, our crew do. So what's the behavioral con, uh, concept of that? What's, how are they feeling? What's the physiological changes? Can we, can we understand from our commercial partners that experience that, you know, again, just a game changer for us? Yeah, I think it's really expanded the accessibility of space. Um, so, you know, NASA, um, instead of being focused on transportation to and from low Earth orbit, we can focus on building vehicles for um, exploration. And, you know, SpaceX is one of, one of the companies, right, coming online um, soon. We'll have um, Boeing as well um, that will be taking astronauts back and forth to the space station. Northrop Grumman provides cargo services. Um, and those are some of the larger companies you hear a lot about. Um, we also have a lot of small companies um, that support the International Space Station and, and research in particular um, that help scientists translate science to on-orbit space operations. Um, and so I think it's really expanded. Um, again, you know, it, it's, it's helped the economy, um, but also commanded their expanded commercial space in, in general. Can I maybe just uh, pull a little bit on what you were just talking there with small companies? And so we actually 
do partner with, there's a, a small business opportunity that NASA provides as a program where you can come in as a small business and uh, look for technologies or what we're calling out for as a need, like maybe I need to look at a blood analysis tool or I need to look at something for my eye vision health and it needs to be small and compact. And so these are ways that we also try to do outreach to the communities and to again foster some of the small business development that hopefully helps not just our space needs but then also on earth applications for the for the company as well all right i'm going to take one more question right here with oh let's see do you also lead experimentation in the energy sector like solar energy from space or looking at nuclear waste we do um so uh i, I guess i'll uh i'll I'll start with the, um, if you're going to space and you need power, solar is your friend. Um, so, you know, you'll see many spacecrafts, not just the International Space Station, harnessing solar power as, as their primary power. Um, we, we have backups too, um, for when we're in what we call insulation or, or out of sunlight. Um, so yes, the International Space Station has massive solar arrays that, that power the station and also charge our batteries um, for when, when we don't have sun. Um, and we have um, contributed to um, new technologies kind of advancing that field that, that we need for space that hopefully we'll start to see um, you know, improving things here on Earth too. So um, one of the ones that we have are called, when they were uh, a tech demo, they were called iROSA, Roll Out Solar Arrays. Um, and uh, we did this as kind of a demonstration on the International Space Station. They're solar arrays that unfurl basically like a blanket. Um, and they're really neat to look at. They just sort of are, are floating, you know, kind of suspended in microgravity um, coming out from the space station. And that was um, to supplement our original solar arrays. Uh, those worked so well as a tech demo uh, that as a program we have adopted them. So now we dropped the, the investigational eye and we call them our ROSA um, rollout solar arrays. And so um, we're replacing and kind of upgrading our power systems on, on space station based on that. Um, we also uh, next week are launching um, SpaceX 30 mission. So this is a cargo flight packed full of science. Um, and we have an investigation on that flight, um, which is looking um, at uh, basically um, improving solar cells. Um, so this is one of our EPSCOR investigations coming out of the educational department, and it's from a university. Um, so we're looking forward to uh, seeing how that research um, comes out. I love what Jen is highlighting here because it's, it's also about material science and moving material science forward too. And so all of these examples that, that you've just listed, Jen, like this is, this is another way of moving the, the, I mean, really moving the needle forward for material science uh, so th that you can do these types of things on Earth as well. So uh, thanks for that example. I think that was a really cool one. Yeah, we didn't talk much about uh, material science, but if you really want to test out um, the robustness of your materials, putting it in space where it's exposed to extreme temperatures, um, atomic oxygen, as well as micrometeoroid uh, um, debris, uh, you basically get these debris hits on the surface, um, are, are a really good way, um, both on small and large scale, to test out how robust uh, your materials are. So we have talked a lot about a lot of different types of research today, a lot of different opportunities. So I wanna bring it all home and ask, how can someone who's interested get their research or their work and work with the space station? Uh, so from the, our human research program, that we, we do solicit for grants. And so if you're a scientist, if you're a researcher, uh, you know, just look and we have grant opportunities where you can uh, apply for a grant. Uh, we also, again, I mentioned earlier, we partner with the, the SBIR program at NASA, and SBIR is really about small businesses and technologies. Um, we also have what we call ground analogs, and these ground analogs actually will mimic a component of space flight. And so if you think about Antarctica and isolation and confinement as an example of a ground analog, and so sometimes, and I think right now we even have open calls for recruitment for uh, ground analogs. And so if you want to experience components of what it's like to be in space or be an astronaut, that's a great opportunity. Uh, we also partner with something called TRISH. It's a Translational Research Institute uh, out at Baylor College of Medicine. They do a lot of the uh, kind of disruptive, outside-the-box thinking on technologies and research as well. And so they will also have solicitations for science and technology development too. 
And on the NASA side, um, we have a um, basically um, announcement of opportunities or um, a, a kind of centralized repository of um, where you can submit grants uh, for NASA funded research. Um, so we'll leave you guys with a QR code at the end that has a link to that. Uh, we love acronyms, so it's called INSPIRES. Um, we also have the ISS National Lab, which I mentioned earlier, um, which, uh, you know, is open um, not just through the NASA um, funding and kind of NASA pathway, but to give everyone um, in, in the United States um, an opportunity um, to fly research in space. Um, I think we have a, a QR code that'll, that'll come up soon that'll have a link to a lot of these different uh, places if you're, if you're interested in working with us. And of course, if you just want to learn more about NASA and get more engaged with NASA in general, we are all over social media and it's amazing content. Um, and you can actually see the International Space Station